is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. What's up? I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of comics that have oh, come out this yeah, week. Oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> this, is, this is a nice old stack we got here. It's I'm not gonna say. too big of a stack. It was like an enjoyable amount of books. It was like a little I'm vacation the, for you. I'm Only 20-something books instead yeah, of 30-something books. It wasn't like a ridiculous amount of like uh, reading where you're just like, I'm buried alive it was a, an enjoyable amount of books oh i'm so glad to hear that pete i'm glad to hear that it tempered down your fury because first book we're going to be talking about <laughs> is fury number one from marvel written by al ewing art by scott eaton and cam smith tom riley Come adam hubert and ramon rosanas so the idea of this book is it's telling two stories simultaneously that meet towards the end about the older nick fury who is now a character called the unseen who lives on the moon with the watcher and some flashbacks about nick fury back in the day as well as nick fury jr who is also nick fury the nick fury who looks like sam jackson in the marvel universe yeah, are you confused yet or just me it's a lot we've talked about this a lot on the podcast this idea that like they feel not only did they go through so many backflips to try to set up, hey, we have Nick Fury who looks like Sam Jackson of the Marvel Universe. Right. But they also feel it's necessary in every single appearance to be like, just to be clear, you're not Nick Fury. You're Nick Fury Jr., the son of Nick Fury, who is currently on the moon and he's a robot, maybe? I'm not 100% clear. Comics, man. Comics, Comics man. This book, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping is the capper on it and this is a spoiler here because what it is is basically a way of being like there is now only one nick fury in the marvel universe it's the one who looks like <laughs> sam jackson the other one's gone he's gone you guys he's out of here the other one's the main one great i mean i don't know why we had to do all that work but let's just say sam jackson got the part and he's fury moving forward and let's just all Let's just roll that way. You know yeah. what I mean? I would like, love somebody to tell Samuel Jackson what they tried to do, what they've been doing in Marvel Comics to get around to be like. I would love versus, to see his versus face. Versus just Ultimate to see Comics, his face which, reaction. mind you, Ultimate Comics was another universe, but Ultimate Comics was being like, here's Nick Fury. He's literally Sam Jackson. Sam Jackson. Let's move on. <laughs> Nobody ever talk about this. That they had to go through so many periodations is insane. So that that's the backstory of this comic book. But I got to say, even with all that backstory, this is a good book. I, I like this book. You yeah. love this? What yeah. did you love about it? Well, first off, the art is just abs. I mean, they're doing so much work here. The fact that the art is is just kind of like old school at times, feeling very old school, and then feeling very modern. It's really impressive the range that we get in this book. Because we're getting all the Furies. We're getting the most recent Fury. We're getting the old school F Fury. So the fact that the art is capturing these different eras in such a great way, I, I felt very, very excited about that. I love the action. I love the storytelling. And it's nice just, to, uh, you know, Samuel Jackson is great. I'm happy that, that, that okay, that's the Fury moving forward. That makes me happy that we've kind of reached this thing. Um, you know, where it's just like, hey, listen, it's, uh, you know, it's a change in the guard. This is what, what we're going to do moving forward. Great. Awesome. Let's just do it. And uh, yeah, because uh, Samuel Jackson is an amazing Nick Fury. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good. There is. Sorry, this is the last thing I'll say about this. This just occurred to me and like that we could move on and talk about the book and the other books and whatever. But it occurs to me that like back in the day, like 30 or 40 years ago, maybe even a little more than that, this would have been one issue, right? Like, oh, Nick Fury is dead. Here's the new Nick Fury. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> and now in modern comics, people are so focused in on continuity and how it works and how this thing connects to the other thing and making it all make sense that they feel like they need to do this big story when it's not always necessary you can do it's it weird because comics at some times can be very kind of like oh you have to do this and you got to explain it and, all that. and other times it's like yep comics you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it's like a weird thing of like sometimes it works really hard to do things and other times it's just like comics sorry <laughs> you know so it's weird that like sometimes it goes in uh, does a lot of work to explain something mm -hmm. that is just like hey this is the new fury now uh so yeah well, and and so we're spending a lot of time focusing on this end result but i do want to emphasize again that like 
This is a very good book. It's very well written. If you've been yeah. reading any of the stuff that Al Ewing has been doing in the Marvel Universe recently, particularly his uh, his Ant Man series, his Wasp series, oh. there was also I think it was Marvel One Thousand. I might be wrong about this, but whatever. He's kind of become the go-to guy to be like, we're unearthing the history of the Marvel Universe and tweaking it and changing it in some way. And he does a very good job of channeling these old school style stories while yeah. doing things that feel modern at the same time. That's He's what I was impressed with because yeah. reading this, it really felt like the old school Nick Fury stories. It mm -hmm. really felt like the modern stuff, you know, and that's impressive to be able to pull off in one issue. Yeah, so even if you haven't been following the saga of Nick Fury and Nick Fury Jr. in the comics, this is still a great one to check out. Let's move on and talk about another highly anticipated book, Supermassive, from Image Comics, written by Kyle Higgins, Ryan Parrott, Melissa Flores, Matt Groom, art by Danielle DiNicolo. This is a big event book that is bringing together the various characters in the massive verse for a adventure. Um, I'll tell you what, this is not what I expected at all from this book. Uh, I don't know how you felt about it, Pete, but I'm curious to get your thoughts about it first. Well, I loved it. I thought this was a, a really cool culmination. Also just kind of has this Voltron anime art style that I felt like really worked in this kind of collision of all these characters. I was super impressed. I thought it would really art bring you into this world took all these characters that are we you getting now... choked up are you getting sad about this no i'm, I'm suppressing a burp because i've been drinking <laughs> beer but thank you uh i, I think it's one of those what's things the difference where... i gotta say yeah, exactly um yeah. you're swallowing either tears or you're swallowing uh you know but I <laughs> whenever just think... i go to a funeral i'm like i'm sorry i really got a burp i got a burp right now <laughs> Yeah. Whenever I go to a funeral, people are always like, are you drinking, sir? I'm like, Shut <laughs> are up. you about to burp? I'm dealing with emotions how I deal with emotions. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, that's what I, I love about this universe is they really are are doing things differently and doing things impressively. Uh, the story kind of leading the way. I, I'm having, I continue to have a blast with this world and this universe. And yeah, I just, uh, I thought this was a really badass, cool story. So to give you a little idea of the story, this is bringing together Rogue Sun, who is the more magically inclined, fiery character from the Massive Verse, the two Radiant Blacks, who are both working together but trying to use this Radiant Black, Black Hole power at the same time. Right, Dead right. Lucky, who is a character who can channel ghosts and electricity powers, yeah. and is more military-oriented. And there's a couple of surprises along the way in terms of other characters who show up, but Frankly, what I was expecting coming into this book is we've had this plot line of these robots who are coming to annihilate Earth in Radiant right, right. Black. And I thought, okay, that's where we're building to our, we're kicking off the big storyline here. That's not nope. what happens here at all. Nope. No, this is about these characters getting together to go coming together, on, coming together to go on a search for the Holy Grail, which I was very surprised about. Uh, it and and it took me a little bit of the book to get used to it, but I think ultimately I appreciate the fact that the idea of the book was more, let's take these disparate characters, figure out how they work together. And then presumably what they're going to do is they're going to bring them back together for this big robot event where they're all attacking Earth. But this really sets this up in a nice, slightly high stakes, lower stakes sort of way, I think. Well, here's the thing, like, I, you know, it, there's this huge kind of event coming, but they got to get it like a practice mish underneath their belt before they're ready for that. So you got to mm -hmm. kind of go Indiana Jones style and be like, listen, let's search for the Holy Grail first. Mm -hmm. You know, do the old witch cop, you know. And that I, I gotta kind of say, stuff. I wish they had gone for the robots. I feel like they chose poorly. Ah, hey, well done, sir. Well Thank done. You. Thank you very much. I don't it's... normally say that to you but that was that was well done <laughs> anyway good crossover book i don't think you need to know anything about any of the books necessarily to pick this up and i actually... wonder if that's you know mm -hmm. what i mean if that's kind of like which i you know that's it's kind of hard because you know the people who've been reading all along are kind of like uh you know but it's a little bit easier to kind of pick right. up, walk in, and just be like, what's well, going I, on? I think it's also the sort of thing where, like, we've been reading all of these books, mind you, yeah. but if you uh, have to no, get Rogue to Sun, it. 
you read yeah. this, you're like, oh, who's this rogue son guy? This is kind of interesting. Maybe I'll check out that book. Or, mm-hmm. oh, I, I missed Dead Lucky. What's going on with Dead Lucky? So, and all these books there. are great. So, it's all like, these books are great, and you should yeah. check them out. Um, so, good stuff. Very fun book. Great team up with these writers. As but you said, were you were pretty thrown by the by the grill instead of the robots. I was, I was very thrown by it. Could you not enjoy this because you wanted it, or were you okay with it? Uh, that is a that's a good question, Pete. Because it uh, seems like you're fighting yourself. A little I am that. fighting myself <laughs> because I know this was a quality book. And like yeah. they did a good job of the characterization. There's really fun bits between the characters. Yes. Like you mentioned with Danielle to Nicolo's art, it is not easy to bring four disparate books together and make it work thematically as art. And, and, and make it still fun. feel like all the characters are. Exactly. In, yes. And it 100% works there. But the way that the story went. I'll get into a spoiler here, but this was the other thing that held me back. The first half of the book, I was like, are we getting towards the robots? When are we going to get to the <laughs> robots? And then when I realized like, okay, we're doing this Holy Grail thing instead. That's what's going on here. It has nothing to do with the robots. At the end, when the end of it was like, well, just tested you guys about that Holy Grail. I was a little let down because I felt like, whoa, what is the, how is this going to pad out? I felt like this was the beginning of something or supposed to be the beginning of something instead of a one-shot tale of these characters getting together. So a lot of it is going to be about how it affects these books going forward in my mind. It's a stupid comic book thing, but how quote-unquote important it is, I think will reflect to me personally how I feel about this book. Yeah, it'll be interesting, dude, because like... I was like, all right, I, I, I think I know what's happening, but because something else happened, I was like, my immediate thought process was like, oh, this makes sense. They need to kind of work together before it's holy crap robot time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like, I was like, okay, smart. We're going to kind of build to it. But if they don't go there, that'll be interesting to see if that really throws you and makes you mad or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, we'll see what happens. Regardless, I'm on board with this universe. I mean, so that's the a, thing. Yeah. Every kind of issue they've been killing it. So we got to kind of give them a little bit, a, a little space here and be like, hey, you guys deserve, uh, because every, regardless of what comic we've been reading, we've been pretty impressed with all of these under this umbrella. So it's it's fun to see this kind of coming together and it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Why don't we turn to what I know is going to be one of, if not your favorite books of the week, City Boy, number one from DC Comics, written by Greg Pak, arc by Minky. We should Young. have him on the show. <laughs> we should. So this is spinning out of a story in one of the Lazarus Planet books is following a teen, I want to say, maybe early 20s. Hard to tell. They don't really give ages often in comics. Mm-hmm. But regardless, he's a guy living on the streets of Gotham City and has the power to detect lost things. We find out his origin story here how it ties into the new enemy that he's going to fight. Pete, take it away. Well, uh, first off, amazing kind of art style. Uh, Just really uh, love the covers. Uh, Amazing last panel. Uh, Very exciting kind of villains and stuff in there. I don't want to spoil anything for people, but man, uh, what a great first issue, kind of getting you used to this world and excited for more. I think this does a great job of kind of doing the things that our first issue should do. Um, can't say enough about the art, and uh, also that that writing is pretty solid, too. That Greg Pak uh, knows how to write things, I think. Yeah, this is a banger of a first issue, I gotta say. the You don't need to have read the previous story at all. That was a really good story, but here... This is almost a fresh start with yeah. not a new setting, but a different take on the setting, a different part of um, uh, Gotham City. I think it's Gotham City and not Metropolis, even though there's a bunch of Metropolis characters that show up here. And we get stakes, we get loss, we get a classic first issue structure here that really nails it emotionally, also in terms of the action, the danger, like you said, by the end of it, the stakes are insanely high for this character in a crazy way. This, to me, feels on par with Duo, the book that Greg Oh, did. yeah. Just in terms of being like, this isn't a sci-fi premise, but it's this is more of a fantasy premise. But the same way that was like, 
okay, we're going to come out out of the gates running with this very strong, clear idea of who these characters are, what their emotional needs are, what they look like, what their world is, what the conflict they're going to be facing is. And it feels totally fresh and unlike anything we have ever seen in DC Comics before. Great stuff. Yeah. Let's move on and talk about something that isn't totally surprising because it's purposefully old school. Storm number one from Marvel, written by oh, Anne oh, Nesenti, yeah. art by Sid Codian. This is another one of these legacy style books that Marvel has been doing. This takes place just after Storm has gotten the Mohawk and taken the jacket off of Callisto after she's taken over the Morlocks. Here she is leading the X-Men, but also locking horns with Kitty Pride in this issue. Who Dude, really approve of her. how are you feeling about this, huh? Uh, oh, Kitty Pride! I don't know. I don't know. Kitty Pryde. I, don't know. I, don't know. I, I don't agree with you, Ad Dissenti. What is your... What, show me your bona fides. What have you ever written oh, that would prove God. that you know what you're oh, talking about wow. with the X-Men? No, I'm kidding, obviously. Um, I, I was curious to hear from you again, Pete, about this one, because... This, I think, is the era of X-Men that you've been asking for. So how did yes. you feel about this? Yeah, I was very excited about this. I love Storm leading the X-Men. I think it's a great choice. It's, uh, it's something that uh, doesn't make me immediately angry, like when Scott Summers is doing it. So uh, I I very much like this. And I also liked um, the kind of different uh, budding heads and the top they actually talk about like leadership styles in here this was very cool um i i thought like this was old school in a lot of different ways but also some kind of new school stuff um yeah i it also fed, made me feel very nostalgic for the old school x-men when you got storm with the mohawk um you know uh, uh talking about uh her, her kind of it's it's a nice kind of throwback and, and it's a nice kind of period as far as x-men where everybody is and um yeah i thought i thought it was very cool and also interesting kind of little snides by professor x there you know what i mean so um interesting it was it really felt like an old school x-men comic with a kind of a modern take on some things and also it was it was very uh just kind of unique to get inside their head a little bit and to kind of talk about leadership and what people will follow and what people rebel against and like you know teens being teens but you know also just kind of like trying to get to a, a group of people to listen to you so yeah i was super impressed with this i thought this was a great first issue really impressed with what they're doing with this i think it's a great way to kind of go back to something and uh still kind of have it uh, feel new and fresh uh so yeah i was super happy with this and it could be because i'm biased and not really enjoying what's happening with x-men so the fact that we got something that's a little no, old school I, I, I think this is one of the more solid legacy books. I was joking earlier, but obviously Anna Senti knows what she's doing in terms of writing. I think the art style challenge, uh, channels sort of a more old school feel very nicely. The one thing that holds me back a little bit, I really like the first half of the book, which was very X-Men focused. But the entire time I was like, this is storm number one. So as much as I am enjoying this and focusing on these X-Men dynamics, I want to see why is this called Storm? Like, what is going on here? And then we had a change of plot that twisted in an entirely different direction in the last couple of pages mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. focused it more squarely on Storm. That, to me, felt like a little taste of what the book is actually going to be going forward. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the second issue when we get to see Storm number two rather than storm and the x-men number one which is what this felt like you get really specific and weird when it comes to titling and like what's in the book um but uh but i think it's an indicator of the story you're going to tell and the story here if it's about storm why are you telling us a story about storm what is it about storm and particularly because we get so much time like I could see an opening scene where it's her leading the X-Men at leads her to a conflict and then we get a solo story about her. But instead, there's a bulk of the book is spent with these X-Men characters, which is enjoyable, but I feel very like, when are we going to get to the fire? Yeah, but it's also about perspective, right? Of like storms kind of going through a crisis in the water, but everybody's playing on the beach. 
And so, you know what I mean? Like we're kind of spending time with them as well to mm -hmm. kind of get like this whole thing about like, you don't know what somebody's going through. You don't know, you know, all the things that are going on just because you're at the same location doesn't mean you're experiencing the same things. I think it's an interesting idea that I hope they're going to explore more. Is also, this about when we were at the beach this past weekend, Pete? Yeah, yeah, I almost died, and you didn't care at all. I was trying to get my rays, man. You know that. My rays are Dude. important for me. This glowing golden skin doesn't, uh, you know, maintain itself. Golden? Golden skin. I think maybe you got to get your eyes checked. Uh, I, I just I'm also think. this wall behind me. <laughs> That's why I was confused why you would compare yourself to gold. Um, I also thought it was it felt very nostalgic to kind of have a Mumra villain towards the end mm -hmm. there. I felt I was like, wow, look at this. I'm getting Storm number one, Mohawk Storm, as well as some Thundercat shout outs. <laughs> Man, my childhood's coming back around, baby. Uh, everything's coming up, Pete. <laughs> well, before your childhood vanishes in front of your very eyes, why don't we talk about Vanish number seven oh, from the Image Comics written by Dottie Cates, art by Ryan Stegman. So if you haven't been following this book, it is about a Harry Potter-esque trio that has gotten older. The Harry Potter character is kind of hitting on hard times. He's bummed out. And when he finds out that the lieutenants of the Voldemort-type character have been pretended to be superheroes, so he becomes a supervillain to fight them. However, the thing that we've been dealing with, this gets into spoilers, but particularly as was starting to be teased and revealed in the last issue and is pretty much confirmed in this issue, uh, Justin is here. Just as we're talking about Vanish, Justin, welcome. I was just setting up the plan. Hey, welcome. Vanish. Oh, I love, I, I feel like when you said Vanish, I appeared. That's oh, what's so crazy. It's that's the opposite it. of that's vanishing. Yeah, that's the opposite. Yeah. There you go. No, I vanish from somewhere else. That's the crazy part. Oh, I see. Uh, I get it now. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I think uh, you were summoned because of your experience with David Copperfield back in the day, which we can't really talk yes. about right now. We don't have time. But no, don't have time. We're in a rush. The thing that I was going to say about Vanish number seven is we finally get confirmation of the thing that I think has been bubbling in the background, that this main character, this Harry Potter type character, is by killing these other supervillains, he is reassembling Vanish. That is what he is doing. Yeah. He's finding the different horcruxes and putting them That's together. That's the word I was going to use, yes. Exactly. But here's the other thing that I wanted to throw out at you guys that is not, I think, been clear throughout this series, but was not readily apparent to me until this issue. I think the thing that Donnie Cates is dealing with is addiction. And this yes. is something that he's been pretty public about that he has dealt with himself, but specifically the idea of like what does addiction do to you what does it do to the people around you what does it make them go through to save you and this to me was i think the strongest issue of the series just because it finally took the lid off of the premise it took the lid off of like the thematic idea of what he's doing here and this is the first time the series beyond being like hardcore throwback to extreme image comics of the 90s felt yeah. like it had a whole lot more going on and really encouraged me, frankly, to want to go back and read the rest of the series now that I'm aware of this stuff. I agree. And I wish they I wish that the team had just done this earlier on because like I love being on more on board with this premise and we're able to sort of feel bad for our main character while also being really like wary of the fact that he seems to be sort of on board with this Voldemort coming through. Yeah, I'm glad we're getting past this, the kind of like, it's more than just hardcore Harry Potter. It's like Harry Potter, but action, adventure, and violence. So I'm I'm glad that we're getting uh, this kind of other layer and this other stuff happening. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I love violence and love action. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's yeah. also nice to get some story in here and... Um, yeah, some really just a lot of flying characters, a lot of characters flying like right at us, but uh, also some really cool ideas and uh, really kind of exploring some things, but also just some like uh, amazing Ryan Otley art here and uh, mm -hmm. love the flash and the fangs is always such a fun thing. Ryan Stegman, you mean? Sorry. Stegmaniac. 
All Ryans look the same to me. Action Comics 1055 from DC Comics, Shouldn't written by that. Philip Kennedy Johnson. I'm racist towards Ryans. Philip Kennedy Johnson, Dan Jurgens, and Dorado Quick. Art by Rafa Sandoval, Lee Weeks, and Yasmin Flores Montanez. The front story here has Superman teaming up with Metallo to try to take down the revealed villain who is behind everything that's happened in the past couple of the issues, who is none other than Cyborg Superman. They recruit yet another person from ah. the death and return of Superman uh, to team up with him that I won't necessarily spoil here, but obviously you guys should free. There's him. only one left. There's <laughs> yeah. only like... They got Superboy there. They got Super Cyborg Superman. Uh, Steel's in the backup. Steel's so... in the backup. Who could it be? I don't know. We'll never know. Yeah, uh, but I love this sort of like secret throwback that we've gotten. Like it's a throwback in the sort of uh, most surprising way, where we snuck up on it through a bunch of different like family uh, zombie style attacks, like all that. The art is fantastic. It sort yeah. of feels a little bit of that era in a way that I didn't realize until they started feeling uh, having the characters from that era. Yeah, I, I, I just continue to think that this is a great package. You're getting three stories mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, the first one just uh, jam-packed with all these. You know, you got the Eradicator, you got the Metallo, you got there's, Cyborg, Superman. You know, it's it's just... Uh, Pete said it. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. We kept it a no, secret. We kept it a secret in Pete said it. <laughs> yeah. said it uh, like... No, but you're right. I agree with you. I, I know I say this almost every issue, but I wish... Maybe not the rest of DC Comics was doing this, but I wish more DC Comics were doing this because it feels like such a, I think I referred to it previously as like a magazine, you know, because you've got this really good action comic Superman story in the front. Then right. you have a throwback story with Dan Jurgens and Lee Weeks, oh. which uh, is fun. You got I a love doomsday. It. it feels very old thing. school. Yeah, it's fun. It's really enjoyable. It feels like Smallville, the next generation, or something like yeah. that, but it's very enjoyable. And then you have a great steel story in the back that yes. feels fresh and new as well. So you get these very different tones in here, and they've been doing that for the a while now, and it's great. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I wish. And I then the fun. Ever... Yeah, go ahead. The fun reveal at the end there, and, and again, spoilers, but. Uh... You got Mr. Terrific showing up. So that's exciting. Yeah. he's. I call him Mr. T. Well, that's confusing because there's already a Mr. T. Yeah, but oh, Mr. Really? Terrific what is, is he, part what is of what I like? would call the A-team of characters. In the oh, this guy. Justin, well, I feel like it, he's when... been killing it the whole time. <laughs> Who, Mr. T or no, Alex? Alex? Yeah. Alex yeah. is well, sort of like, I pity the fool that doesn't respect <laughs> Alex's uh, hosting. Thanks, man. I, I echo that, and I daredevil and echo number uh, one that. For I love when a plan comes together. Boo and B Earl art by Phil Noto. This is, of course, teaming up daredevil and echo kind of to solve a mystery, though it spans over multiple eras. I thought this was awesome. I yeah. loved the writing here. I thought the story was fascinating. It was so great to not get Chip Zdarsky's bearded, broken Daredevil, who only has one eye now, teaming up with Echo. The art by Phil Noto is phenomenal, yes. as always. I went into this being like, not necessarily trepidatious, but like, eh, I don't know. Is this going to just be a kind of a nothing story? And it is so How much dare better. you. It's a something story. How yeah. dare devil? How dare devil <laughs> with that attitude? Um, I agree. I, I thought this was great. I love the sort of uh, time span that this story uh, takes. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. Phil Noto art is, you know, I talked a lot about on the main Daredevil book, like give this guy a break. Everything is crushing him. And honestly, this story being a little bit different, but the Phil Noto art just having a little bit of brightness to it and like sort of like hey let's get things back organized with the clean lines that he's using just was a the refreshing uh bit of palate cleansing like a bright sorbet that i needed yeah i i really love this uh i agree the art is just absolutely beautiful and i would compare it to a, a lovely sorbet as well um i just think that uh daredevil <laughs> sorbet <laughs> uh, I think that this is just 
such an interesting kind of team coming together for this. And I was very happy with the story, very kind of impressed with all the moving pieces that we're working with that felt seamless. Like, uh, you know, uh, Daredevil's on the roof, Elektra's there, like, uh, talking some shit. And then, you know, we're moving on to Echo. So, like, I really appreciated the kind of, like, little check-in moments that we had and then kind of moving the story forward with this whole kind of villain and the whole pound of flesh, which we've yeah. heard and seen before, but this is a little creepier and a little different. So, yeah, I was super impressed with this as far as the number one. They did a great job of setting up this world and getting us excited for more. So, uh, killing it. And, uh, yeah, I am i can't, can't wait for the next issue of this. You know, when Prince wrote the song, it was originally called Daredevil Sorbet, but the French made him change it to be about oh, a parade. Another terrible thing that the French have done. Hey. Terror War number two from Image Comics, written by Saladin Ahmed, art by Dave Acosta. This is taking place in a future world where there are teams of fighters who are tasked with fighting nightmares that come into our reality. They have brain bullets. The only things they can draw is destroy these nightmares. This book is satirical and ridiculous, but there's actual stakes at the same time. I really love the first issue of this. Curious to hear what you guys thought about the second one. Mm, well i what's nice is the creativity of this book like this is a super weird book but it's also really kind of cool to see what kind of villains and how they deal with it and all the kind of weirdness that it goes into it i'm having a good time with this i still think uh uh it i'm kind of like what's going on a little bit but i'm still i'm having a great time and uh yeah i'm uh i i like this book i really think the art's awesome like the weird fire monsters that we kind of get in this is it's very kind of like uh unique and not just like they're they're fighting a fire it's kind of like you know the faces and all that are pretty cool yeah faces in the fire yeah, just yeah. like regular candles and stuff i was surprised this felt like being dropped into the middle of like the opening sequence of saving private ryan where i was like Whoa. what's going on what's happening there's a lot of things happening um so i was a little bit uh sort of trying to catch up i guess while i was reading this uh but i agree i i do like these ideas at play i guess i just want a couple characters i can really grab onto there's uh... That is the one thing that's tough about this book, I think, right now, because you've got this one team of terror fighters who we met in the previous issue. Right. They are presented with another team of terror fighters at the, at the end of the issue. That's the a fighter. rival team. It's a rival, rival team. team. And they're both fighting in this issue. Uh, and first they, they have... hate each other, but then they got to work together. But right. then, oh. So there's a lot of gotcha. that sort of stuff going on. So I think, like you guys are saying, we aren't quite hooked into these characters emotionally yet, but I think we're getting there. And I like the art, and I like the tone. It's very funny, and it's very arch. So I'm enjoying this book a lot. Um, but yeah, I I'm curious to see where it goes. Nightwing 104 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, uh, C.S. Picot, art by Travis Moore and Daniel Hoare. The front story is Nightwing and the Titans trying to protect a little girl at the end of the last issue. Neron gave Nightwing superpowers. As we find out, he has two oh, hours man. of superpowers uh. that he can use any way he wants. This issue wraps up the whole Titans Neron storyline. And then like Justin was hoping, presumably it gets back to just Nightwing in the next issue. Yeah, just my guy. Yeah. And in the backup story, we get Nightwing and Superman, AKA John Kent Superman are teaming up together to solve a mystery at a circus. What'd you guys think about this one? I mean, this was great. It was really fun the way kind of Nightwing handled getting superpowers and super like, oh, yeah, he's going to race the Flash. Oh, man, he's going to go see uh, Superman, try to shake his hand. Very touching the way uh, Superman kind of was like, yo, I want to show you a cool spot, talking to him. I really loved all that, kind of got me in the feels. But I'm also super happy that we kindly, finally kind of wrapped up this whole kind of like kid situation and what we're going to do with that. And I really liked how that was all handled too. So I was really worried about that good little girl, but uh, hopefully, you know, you know, the, the good guys saved the day there. So that was really nice, but art was great. This was, this continues to be such a great book. 
I feel like um, using Tom Taylor, using the um, Nightwing sort of platform to bring, be like, look, the Titans are cool. Go read this other Titans book. It was nice. Like I, I, and I thought this brought some of the themes together, the idea that um, Nightwing having superpowers and we get to see some of his sort of wishes come true, uh, yeah. I think was really cool. Great callback uh, to an earlier arc with the way he sort of solves his problem. Uh, but like much like Pete, I am excited to get back to sort of the Nightwing focus story. But, you know, it's hard to be mad at this book in any capacity. Yeah, I agree with that. I like this as well. The one, the one like oh. little quibble that what? I have here. Oh, is... got a quibble. A quibble alert. Someone turn on the quibble siren. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Is the whole idea here is Neron's like, I know how to tempt Nightwing. I'm going to give him superpowers and show him all the good he could do and be like, you could have all these superpowers all the time in exchange, for, in exchange for the soul of this little girl forever. There is zero point reading this book where I'm like, yeah, Nightwing is going to agree with that. He's tempted in literally any way whatsoever. I wish... I love getting to see Nightwing with superpowers. That's very fun. That's a really uh, enjoyable thing that like drives down on what Tam Taylor is saying about Nightwing. But there is no tension for me. Well, with the I, I would like to rebut your quibble, sir, because mm. oh, oh, put on the quibble, the quibble rebuttal, rebuttal siren. All right. Rip. Rip. For it's this the villain, reverse. Yeah, uh, reverse. who is kind of obsessed with you know power. The kind of like trying to, you know, understand, you know, good and bad and all that. I felt like he had a smart idea, a, a thing that he believed. Like once somebody gets superpowers, they're not going to want to get it out. You're not going to want to be like, yo, listen, I got superpowers. You know, no, it would be hard to give it up. And this idea of like, Nightwing, think about how much more you could accomplish if you did have superpowers, you know what I mean? So like, it's an interesting idea, you know, at different times of life, maybe Nightwing might fall for that, but I feel like Nightwing's in a good place. He's not going to fall for that. I think maybe, maybe never, but I don't know. But I just thought it was an interesting idea of like, if you had superpowers, but we had to take away from you, what would you do to be okay with still having all that power? You know what I mean? I think a villain, would think that there's no way somebody could do that, not understanding somebody who is a good person and okay with who they are and all that kind of stuff. So I felt like it it made sense for them to be like, no way nobody's giving up superpowers. This is a brilliant plan. So yeah. I kind of felt that. If this was a book called Neuron, then I feel like that would make a lot of sense. Whereas <laughs> him being like, I know, I'll just tempt him. But I think it's time for the rebut undercut because what I would say in, in response <laughs> to both of you, <laughs> yeah, that's just chaos noises. Uh, <laughs> The more interesting choice in all of these is to have Nightwing say, I will take those powers. I will, because then I can do do more good. And then eventually <laughs> I'll come back and rescue this girl. That's a choice eventually. that I think, I think that's a choice that lines She's up She's going to die right away, bro. You can't I, just I, I, I appreciate what oh, you're I saying. I can put this put little girl idea. on my to-do list. Yeah, and eventually, being like, first once of all, I raise the this flash, little girl. And then, yeah. Send her to fucking hell. <laughs> She's just hanging in hell, which is oh like, oh my god, it's not a permanent super nice place. I would love that actually. If that was like, you know what, these superpowers are actually really good. And the rest of the Titans, you're like, what? Hey, what? The fuck? It's not about him being being uh, like selfish about it. It's about him saying, I can do more good if I have more power. Mm -hmm. Like that lines up with some of the things that Nightwing has been saying. Where it's what like, would be I'm great is if he was like, yes, I would like this power. And then he took that little girl and like punched her right in the nose yeah, and like, broke her nose. How many like, little girls do I got to punch <laughs> to keep this power? <laughs> and it, it, Neron would be like three. And he'd be like, okay. <laughs> on it. <laughs> got on it. it. Just lined up little girls and just boom, going down the line. Just... <laughs> Not punching them hard enough to kill them, to be very clear. Yeah, just hard gentle. enough to break their nose. And uh, that's it. And then he gets to fly around. He can finally be a wing. <laughs> yeah, How many girls would it take for you to punch in the face to get to the flowers? Because that's Nightwing, the question. Nightwing turns to Nightwing is like, just to be clear, for every little girl I punch, I get two hours. Right? I get two hours? Two hours, that's it. And Put it in. Garrett's like, yeah. And he's like, sounds good. 
I think we get a fun we get a fun spawn clock with him counting down uh, oh, his powers and counting up and his then, little girl punch. And then his like to do list of like don't forget to save little girl. It's like ah, yeah. oh, I keep meaning to do that. Yeah, this uh, is really cool. It's like hour mad, except he's two hour mad, and instead of taking a pill, he punches little girls in the nose and breaks their nose. Oh man, two hour man's a great idea. Great pitch. <laughs> that to Twice me is like. <laughs> DC, Dan Dio comes into the office and he's like, guys, I got an idea. <laughs> Tell you what, it's, it's hour twice man. as good, it's twice okay, as good as the last Everybody loves Hour Man. The robot Hour Man, they all love it. Two Hour Man. It's good. Yeah, we're and building then our own like, uh, slate around this. All right, why don't we move on? Star 24 Wars Hour Star- Man. <laughs> Superman. <laughs> Too much. Two Hour Man, that's a tops. Maybe three hour man. I don't know. Star Wars, <laughs> Darth Vader, Black, White, and Red. Yes. Two, Marvel, written by Jason Aaron, David Pipos, and uh, Victoria Yig. Art by Leonard Kirk, Alessandro Vitti, and Marika Cresta. This is three short stories about Darth Vader. The first one, the Jason Aaron Leonard Kirk one, is a continuing one where Darth yeah. Vader was incapacitated by what is revealed in this issue to be a trial run for Darth Vader, which is a wild, crazy twist. Uh, yeah. I, I think we were very pleasantly surprised by the first issue of this. Pete, it seems like you were even more pleasantly surprised by the second one. Yes, I agree. We get, uh, we get three stories in this, and it's really... Uh, you agree? I, agree. I disagree. I, we don't get three stories in this. Uh, yeah, I'm having, I had a blast with this. I really love the use of red in this. Um, the... <laughs> What did you think about the black and the white? Well, great. Also, <laughs> I love, wait, I'm let's a rank them. Let's rank them. I <laughs> I'm a do. sucker for black and white art, so this is all my sweet spots. Uh, I do think the second story, this Darth, uh, you know, Star Wars meets Aliens kind of thing, was such a fun uh, kind of romp to go on. I just thought it was such a cool idea and a fun mix of things. Um, and, uh, yeah, I also really loved the third story and this kind of just position of the kind of red background with the black helmet of Darth Vader. It was just such mm. a cool, unique look, a lot of amazing panels in this, but yeah, I love the story. Really love the art, the black and white with the red popping everywhere. It was just so much fun and so unique. I, I really had a great time with it. I feel like we lean a little bit into the red in this, you know what I mean? There's yeah, we do. A lot of red, baby. Just put no, the th- red up there. Just have no. dripping red from the pages. You know what I mean? It's black, white, and red, right? Not red, red, white, and black. Red, red, and red, and then sometimes some black and white. That's what it felt like. And so it was a little much uh, in that regard. But I uh, like the first issue more than this one. I thought this one, like, I, I'm into the Jason Aaron story. Come on, man. I- no, but I, I like this format. I think this is a great way to tell us more Darth Vader stories without having to be like, this story takes place uh, in the minute eight of Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> it lets us push out a little further, so I'm here for that. Yeah, I thought uh, these were three strong stories about Darth Vader. The Jason Aaron story is absolutely wild, but I think the David Pipo story and the Victoria Ying story were both strong as well. This is a good collection. I didn't know what to expect from this, but I'm really enjoying this so far. Indigo Children, number three from Image Comics, written by Kurt Pyers, art by Rockwell White. This takes place in the world where there are a bunch of children who have different powers, each has specific powers, and essentially they've had their memories wiped or repressed. We're not 100% sure so far, but they are starting to slowly find each other and reactivate each other's memories. We are really getting to it here as we're getting down to the final two Indigo children while we're watching the forces that are coming against them. This comic is ramping up exponentially in the action every issue in a wild way. I love this title. I feel like, to your point, Alex, each issue keeps getting better, I think. I like uh, our as the team's coming together and sort of occupying different roles as they go and find the rest of the uh, Indigo children. I love the, just the standalone story. We learn about um, this third Indigo child that, that uh, joins the team after her the, her the reality of her life is revealed to her. It oh, was man. just a great, like, 
that her story was just a great standalone story. I would read that as a standalone issue. And on top of it, we get the great overarching story here. This is one of my favorite series uh, that's been coming out lately. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how you get children because I don't have any and you guys have it, but I hope you guys didn't. Sorry, mur- sorry, murder. sorry. Murder sorry, his, sorry, sorry. Somebody's parents and then just take a kid. You know uh, I just mean? one, I just one quick question, Pete. You said you're not sure how to get children. Yeah, yeah. you said you're not sure because in this comic, how, how you how a child sure? is you murder the parents and then you take that child and raise them as their as you know you would their own. And so I'm are just you wondering saying, if that's what you guys did. Are you saying that's your number one way that you get a child? I don't know. I don't. I didn't get any children. Hey, I don't have when any, a man so and a woman guys love them. each other very much. They kill somebody else and they exactly. take their children. Yeah, exactly. So that's how yeah, I did it. Parents are fucked up, man. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think love that... my other person's kids. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta well, say, Pete, don't go to Park Slope, Brooklyn, because there's a lot of murderers there. I bet. I bet. <laughs> All those kids in strollers, man. I mean, where are I, they? I just want to say real quick that Rockwell White's art on here is out of control. I think like. There, there's a page spread. I don't think it's a double page spread. It's a page spread where the Indigo child in this gets their memory back, where all the memories uh, are spreading out yeah. from what, I don't want to spoil it, but what's happening in the middle of the page. Phenomenal layout there. I, this is so good. And I did write it down, but whoever does the colors for this book as well, like that should not be undervalued given the fact that Indigo is such a big part of it. Great stuff. It's sort of like um, uh, a blue. Mm. Uh, so that's what you're wondering. Is D. D. Kniff. Kniff, yeah. There you go. Fuck Unstoppable you. Doom Patrol number three Fuck from DC Comics, written by I Dennis. Was fucking piece of shit. Up. I was looking it up. I was looking it up, man. <laughs> Didn't say the name fast and, enough. Hey, yeah. you both said it. It was great. You said it beautifully. Unstoppable Doom Patrol number three from DC Comics, written by Dennis Culver, art by Chris Burnham. I am super bummed that this is just a limited series instead of yes. an ongoing book because it is so much fun. In this yes. issue, we get a mild parody of the Fast and the Furious as several members Too of the Doom Patrol try to Too take uh, Starbro, who is a dude. Starbro. Attached to a Starro, but become its own kind of <laughs> own psychic Call entity. The they are being chased around by Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner, and they're in a race around town. This is so much fun. This is a unlimited possibility in the DC universe, and I hope enough people read this that it can become an ongoing the same way the Poison Agreed. Ivy did, because I'm having such mm. a blast. Agreed, 100%. This is just absolutely fantastic. It's so creative, so much fun. Love the art style. We kind of get a fun road trip here. You got Starbro, you got Cliff, the negative man. This is just great, fun stuff. And plus, they're making fun of Green Lanterns as the douchebag cops that they are. And it's just a, a blast. It's just so, they're just kind of making fun of DC comics, making fun of themselves. It's just, it's very creative. It's a ton of fun. The art is fantastic. I love this issue. I love all the stuff that happens. I'm having a great time with this and I don't want it to end. Um, yeah, I agree. It is, it is very fun. I'm trying to feel like, figure out where it fits into, into the larger DC universe. And it feels like it's its own thing. It has um, a little bit of like Justice League dark energy where it's like right next to the main superhero world but um, and including some of them, but it is actually operating completely on its own. But this is the kind of stuff that I like to see that DC does, taking some risks and having these stories that aren't so superhero forward. Um, very fun. Thor number 34 from Marvel, written by Torin Gronbach, art by Juan Gedeon and Sergio de Villa. I got to be honest, we haven't been really keeping up with Thor, but part of the reason I threw this on the stack is that Thanos was fighting Doom on the cover, and that seemed cool. So (laughs) there's a lot of... picked it for the cover. I picked it. It's worth it for the cover alone, as I always like to say. That cover Uh. is bananas good. There's a lot going on in this book, as Thor is trying to save a child who... This is a spoiler, but I think it, it reveals a lot of the story. It turns out that the child is Hela reborn, and they are yeah. slowly Hela. raising Hela up. Who? Meanwhile, back in time, Thanos and Doctor Doom are trying to chase down what they think is a black stone, a new black infinity stone. So this is a big thing that is going to lead to bigger things for the Marvel Universe going forward. We know it's tying into that and setting that all up. But again, 
lots of stuff going on in this issue. What do you guys think? So this is the classic story of like, you know, going back in time and killing Hitler as a baby. You know, you got Thanos standing over this baby with a knife and he's just kind of like, I don't know if I can stab this baby in the face, you know. Uh, Nightwing would punch a, a kid in the face, but I don't know if the Thanos would. So it Similar was, that's characters. Thanos has always been a more heroic character than Nightwing. Oh. I, always, I, I think of Thanos as the Nightwing of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> Mm. Wow. <laughs> Similar. Whoa. Both wow. both were in the circus. Okay. Okay. Fact check me on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do love Doom in this. Doom is almost a a, a good uh good guy in this, which I always appreciate. Uh but yeah, I I just thought this was such a fun mix of characters and used really well. Um, yeah, I also really like the art choices, the kind of like the grayed out stuff that we got in here. Tons of action, but it, it felt like this kind of like uh, new school meets old school. Uh, yeah, I just I thought it's a very unique and cool book and kind of deals with this old Hitler time baby idea in a new fresh way. So, uh, yeah, I was there <laughs> for it and uh, I'm excited for more. It's interesting that this um, it may be leading into some larger Marvel ramifications because it's sort of a real sneak up. Like seeing Thanos pop in, you have all these people dressed in their like Norse clothes and then he's in his little outfit. I thought was just such a funny, uh, weird thing. I am not sure that the teaser for the next issue is sort of the end, but also the beginning of all things. So looking forward to see what seeing where that goes but in general this feels a little bit like some dc style energy mm -hmm. like hey it's like a the, a thing you know about the infinity stones but a worse one shows up it, injected into the marvel universe what's the furthest place from here number 13 from image comics written by matthew rosenberg art by Bernie. tyler boss in this issue we're following two of our main characters from the academy who have been imprisoned in a zoo in a heartbreaking story that is a prison break story or at least it seems like it should be another powerful uh, sad issue of this book dude yeah, yeah. This, this book is such a vibe it's such a like it, you know you don't quite it's very hard to see the overall picture we're sort of jumping in and out of these different um tribes or groups or whatever in their little their homes and i i i like i really like all of it but it's the tone is what carries through. Everything is like bleak, but also youthful, but also trying hard in a good way with great art to punctuate it. Like no other book has the tone that this book has. And I really enjoy that. Yeah, I agree. The the kind of the vibe, the tone that the art sets up, the colors, they kind of like all, uh, it, it, it really brings you into this world in such a unique and cool way. This is just kind of like this crazy jailbreak but man the weight of everything it's it's a very unique and uh creative book that uh every time i pick it up i have no idea what i'm gonna get but i'm usually really impressed so it's a, it's an impressive what this book is doing and how uh, how it's doing it but it's also fucking really t uh, tugging at the old heartstrings i fucking tell you that much she's yeah Green Arrow, number two from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Sean Isaacs. So Oliver Queen is lost somewhere in time, somewhere in space. We don't exactly know, but he is there with Arsenal's daughter. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Arsenal and Black Canary are teaming up to try to figure out exactly where they've gone. So we've got this whole mystery structure in two different places going on at the same time with members of the Green Arrow family. What did you think about this issue? I like Green Arrow falling through the multiverse a little bit. Um, a character that I feel like when we get him out of his pocket, he's better uh, because he, he's such a one of the, he's one of those characters that just doesn't change. It's very, has a very specific philosophy, skill set, and everything is sort of like right in line. So getting him into another place, I think is really cool. And then, uh, we get a character reveal at the end of this that I thought was interesting, and I'm curious how that, on the last, uh, sort of the last page, how that plays in. It feels like sort of a different um, tone or energy to bring to the Green Arrowverse here. I don't know why he would change. He's at the peak of technology, you know what I mean? Like, he has, he's mastered the bow and arrow, 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? There's nothing else that you can master that is more technologically advanced than that. So why yeah. change? You know That's I mean? how you change the TV station on your TV, right? <laughs> you know it. I know uh, you turn it. When we finish podcasting, you, I see you uh, stretch an arrow back and shoot it right into your laptop to turn right. it off. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, I go through a lot of, a lot of laptops, but it's worth it every time. Uh, first off, some great covers. Love the, the whole kind of premise of this kind of splitting up the family to kind of get them back together. Uh, also really like the reveal at the end there. I don't want to spoil it, but it's kind of a fun, kind of fun last couple of panels. Uh, yeah, I, it, it is stuff that we've, uh, you know, seen before, but, uh, I, I love it. And, um, it's a, a cool story and, uh, uh, I'm having a great time. The excellent number three from Marvel written by Peter Milligan art by Michael Allred. This is continuing the story of two teams. Just want that social media clout. That's all they're going uh, for, and they will kill whoever it yeah, takes they will. to get there. Uh, this is my favorite issue of this new series so far, I think. It oh. really dives into the social media commentary in a very serious and is apocalyptic it, way. Yeah. Is it because you wish you could spit on people and they would slowly die in front of you? Oh, my God. A dream. Please uh, <laughs> sign me up. Uh, yes, please. Table for one. Uh, <laughs> check, please. Right? All wow. of that. I'll uh, have yeah, what wow. he's having. Yeah. Uh, I'll have, yeah. I'll bring you the check, sir, but you haven't even ordered yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, check, please. Uh, I love walking into restaurants and just being like, uh, check, please. Yeah. They love it. Waiters love that as a, just a comment. They think what? that's really fun. Yeah, they've never guy, heard of it This guy's before. great. Get him a free dinner. He already oh paid Oh, my God. It's so funny. Yeah. Well, all right. Why don't we move on and talk about another comic book? What did you think about uh, this? I thought this was also excellent. Uh, I, I do think this is a book that... Uh, each issue builds towards sort of the larger point at sort of like we, we know the world that this book is covering and it's edging closer and it doesn't uh, shy away from doing horrible things like uh, much like you just mentioned with the spitting on people. Yeah, I think that, you know, the real hero of this book is the art. I mean, this is super type banana stuff. It's really uh, kind of such it's a, a classic unique. team. Yeah, it's a unique, cool style. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, some of the stuff going on in the comic is, is for comedic effect, but um, it's also twisted and dark and kind of messed up. So I'm enjoying it on that level as well. The Forge, number three from Image Comics, written by Greg Rucka and Eric Troutman, art by Mike Henderson. This is following a bunch of mech warriors who've been trapped on an alien planet by worm creatures who are teaming up with an ethereal precognitive goddess who is trying to lead them out of that for unknown reasons. So lots going on in this book, but big action. As I mentioned with previous issues, Mike Henderson's art is out of control here in terms of the action, but also the clarity of the action. I can't understand that enough. Um, I love the series. Well, this is a a book that is in such, the the creative team is in such command of the story. Like, it's a complicated story. There's complex things. There's some coyness happening where we we don't know why um, the precognitive goddess, where the powers come from and what the point of sort of the, her choices are but like i still ride with this like i you're right there with it you're following it along even the complicated technology they're dealing with it's it's just what really well thought out which is no surprise coming from greg rocka so i enjoy yeah i i think it's one of those things where i i agree with everything that is said i i love all the intense battle stuff and the you know the barely making it out alive the the intense uh kind of like a mecca art style that we kind of got in this which was great clean lines a lot of amazing action over the top stuff um yeah it's all very interesting and fun i think it would just be really annoying to have somebody just like constantly being like you got to do this in two seconds you have four seconds until this happens 30 you know what i mean like you know what i mean i would i kind of be like you know stop just i we get it it's all and going seven to seconds till we get to the next comic yeah six yeah yeah five yeah. 
All Eight Eyes, number two from Dark Horse Comics, written by Steve Fox, art by Piotr Kowalski. This is the Kowalski. most terrifying book on the stands right now. Nobody should ever read it because it's about giant spiders. Let's go! Yeah! Out. Yes! Totally agree. Don't you like that read Alex this is comic. I'm no. scared out of my wits reading this yes, book. This it's is... a fucking nightmare. Now... Like, uh, first off, abandoned buildings are scary as fuck already. But now I'm thinking there's fucking giant spiders in there now. And uh, it's made everything worse. Just everything but is now worse. Is it because they're giant? Because I I know how much you guys like regular spiders. No. <laughs> no? No. Oh, my God. I feel great. I, I'm so bad. I keep sending you boxes of spiders. You oh do, and God. I wish... You would stop doing that. That would be the okay. worst thing that you could mail. I'll just anyway. go back to what I did before, which is go to your house and just uh, dump them out in <laughs> uh, in your basement. Is that that's better? Because it's less of a no, mail. No, that's thing. also not good. I've told you a couple of different times in many different ways that that, that is not good. I no. You're they say you. Out. Everybody swallows two spiders every night. They're alive. And I know. <laughs> I know that for it's a fact eight. because the Snapple fact is an average human swallows eight spiders in their lifetime, in their sleep. In their and lifetime. That fucking Snapple fact has haunted the shit out of me. Yeah. I and know for a fact that's true because when you guys go to sleep, I come into your house and put a spider in your mouth. <laughs> do you know what I do, actually? I used to uh, sneak into stores and put eight spiders in each Snapple. So I was like, let's oh, get this wow. out of the way all at the same time. Well, they shouldn't have, Snapple shouldn't have released that all spiders flavor of their fun <laughs> beverage. All spiders iced tea. I enjoyed yeah, the sorry. Kiwi spiders. Yeah. Sorry, we. <laughs> I enjoyed the 50 we... 50. That was like half iced tea, half spiders. That was much better. Yeah. Uh, definitely. That's I the, mean, uh... <laughs> the art in this is great, but it's also creepy as fuck. So I can't really enjoy it. Um, I couldn't remember the name of the golfer that a half lemonade and half iced tea is named after. Arnie, so Palmer? I, Arnie Palmer? I almost yeah. called it, I literally almost said it's called a Tom Hardy. <laughs> but, that, but that may be what a half tea, half spiders is called it. An yeah, actor, exactly. Tom Hardy. That's, that's true. Uh, this book college. is actually very good. I it, love uh, this book. Yeah. This book is a, a no. little scary, but no. I, there's also there's also like an underlying philosophy to what the characters are going through. It has a, sort of the energy of the movie They Live, uh, if you're familiar with that, where like these few characters can see the world, the changes happening in the world around them, and no one else uh, can can see it. So I, I'm into that. And the spiders are scary, but it's good to be scared. This is very stupid, and I definitely missed it, I'm sure, in the first issue. But in this issue, so one of my issues with the, one of my problems with the first issue was the fact that, like, they're in New York. There are giant spiders everywhere. Everybody's like, no, there aren't. What are you talking about? Even though they physically see these giant spiders. I couldn't wrap my head around how everybody was ignoring that. In the second issue, it's very clearly established this is taking place in 1999. And as soon as that, I that is it, weird. Yeah. But well, no, but as soon as they were like 1999, I was like, oh, OK, that's good. That's so nobody knows. They don't have uh, smartphones or whatever. Well, let oh. me say, if that's the underlying because the the references are like Bloomberg, Bloomberg's going to be present. I was like, why are we doing this? Why are we trying so hard? uh to do this but whatever that's fine yeah and is i think that... it's set there so that it's like if it was the internet it would already be all over the place right so beginnings of the internet it's okay there's dial up still and everything it's tough to get information ain't it cool news is in its prime you know wow. yeah anyway great terrifying book i i think it is frankly the mark of a good book if it scares you that much when you're reading it want to move on talk about a lighter horror book hollows eve number three from marvel oh. written by erica schultz art by brian reber this is following a character who used to be dayton ben riley and now she has some magic and masks that can turn her into monsters in this issue she comes face to face with the one and only amazing spider-man Oh, yeah. Uh, I really like this book. This is one of my uh, favorite characters in the Marvel Universe right now. Favorite new characters, like, the power set's really interesting. I like the sort of riding the line from villain to hero that we've been following here. The art's really interesting. And it has these sort of scary edges to it that uh, you don't get a ton in, in all Marvel Universe. So I, I've been really pleasantly surprised by this. Yeah, I also was super happy with this. I, when I 
every time I start this uh, this book or, or the last issue as well, I'm like, why isn't this just coming out around Halloween time? And then I was like, all right, man, you need to get over that and just kind of enjoy this book for what it is. And once I did that, I, w I had a blast. I really liked this character. I liked this power set. This is very cool and unique and different. And I'm having fun. Also fun kind of last page. Uh, really like the clean art lines and all that kind of stuff. I think it, it's very kind of, it's a cool book, and uh, I'm I'm having fun with it. Pete, was it like too fun. scary? <laughs> was it too scary? For it you, wasn't Pete? too scary because there was a, there were one of the one spider in it. Like the there wasn't book. one spider in it, so I was enjoying that. I was going to say that this is like uh, finding a Reese's pumpkin in the grocery store, and you're like, "What's going on here? Why is it here now? It's May," and then you get it, and you're like, "Oh, this is a lot of peanut butter. This is pretty good." It wow. And good. you're over there just eating old candy in the corner. <laughs> yeah, why not, man? And oh, yeah. Candy doesn't get old. It just gets better. Uh... All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Radiant Pink, number five, from Image Comics, written by Megan Camarena and Melissa Flores, art by Emma Kubert. This is finishing this miniseries as we follow Radiant Pink, getting back to Earth, fighting her girlfriend, and ultimately deciding to deal with her own mental health. Uh... How did you feel about the wrap-up of this series? I felt I, I liked it. I thought it was like a uh, cool ending. It's very smart, very kind of uh, now, which was great. Um, also, the you know, it's a great way to handle a breakup. Like I'm gonna just drop you off at this place. You'll never be able to leave. Uh, that's a that's a you know. That's Real a quick, cool... Pete, just name a couple of your exes that you'd like to do that. With. Go ahead. <laughs> It's a bad uh, time. No, thank you. No, thank you. But I do think that uh, I'm not going to fall for that trap. I do think that. <laughs> and they... we all know the answer is all of them. So I think it's fine. <laughs> I don't know about that. That but, trap. Um, I do think, though, that. That, um, old, that old trap. This is yeah, a great that's character. Not even, that sort of trap isn't even like a box with a stick and a string. It's just a piece of meat lying out of the woods. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But, trap a sign that reads trap pointed out. yeah i was gonna say the steak sauce spells out a trap but i think it's uh this is just uh, a very creative cool book and uh the art's absolutely fantastic i love this character i love the character voice i feel like uh the way this kind of wrapped up made a lot of sense for this character and worked well with this character and kind of had a nice message at the end uh, of all of the massive verse titles, this one it feels like it's the most sort of going off in a direction that I don't quite see it all fitting together. So many of the, the massive titles are really, you can feel the picture they're painting. And this one feels like, it, it's, with this issue anyway, it feels like it's a little bit off off to the edge. So I uh, am so, I the fact that this is the last issue makes sense, but again, it felt like it was almost one issue extra to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, because the idea of the series was the two of them lost in some sort of weird multiverse going to different planets together. So yeah. for to end in this way where it's them versus each other on Earth and getting back to that, it either felt like it needed multiple more issues in an additional yeah. arc or it needed to wrap up after the traveling through the universe thing either way. Um, but yeah, I, I still liked a lot of the character moves and the characterizations of this book. I think Emma Kubert's art is good. So I'm glad they did it. I would say the art is great, not just good. Mm. Wow. Thanks for the fix. Interesting. How good, Pete? Any characterization for it or just good? I, I would say I great is what I said, you fucker. Oh, um, okay. So yeah, I just don't think you're you're undercutting it a little too much. I like the the style. <laughs> Sorry. No sort of character. fruit that you'd characterize it with. <laughs> no. Hmm. no. No. Oh wow. <laughs> you, <All right>. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no? Well, no. it's crazy, Pete, because I'm putting together, I just want to try to understand what is the sure, difference sure. Between, banana, between great and bananas good. <laughs> yeah. Are they big, the same? There's a big difference, and I don't know if we have enough time to get into this. Maybe in the like, uh, Week in Geek we can... Uh, I'm working I'm working on the Duolingo for speaking Pete, and I just <laughs> want to make sure I, get, I nail this because it feels right. important for people who want to really speak Pete. Yeah, and I'm doing the voice for that uh, short guy with the mustache when he says, Banado's good. <laughs> mustache? Yeah, the mustache guy goes, oh, Banado's good. That guy. When, does that, when does that guy show up? Yeah, eh, sometimes. Mostly in my oh. Spanish lessons. 
007 for King and Country, number two from Dynamite, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Giorgio Spalletta. This is following the story of 007 on the run from MI6 as they are tracking him down. Are there a number of sexy ladies in his path? You bet there are. Are there bad guys in his path? Oh, oh yes, there are as what well. What are you doing? No, oh, 007, how will you get out of this one? <laughs> What is happening? Yeah. I feel like this is just, uh, you know, fun James Bond action stuff. We got some fun car chases, some shootouts, some traps. Yeah, this is very cool art. Love the panels. Love the, the action. The art portrays, like, the different kind of shadings and stuff. And the, the scope shots are really intense. And great use of the comic form. Great use of the comic form. I, I really like this. It feels like the way that you can extend Bond into a new type of story. Uh, like it, it, it doesn't have this sort of like, um, like Mission Impossible, like, oh, look, the organization you're working for is evil now. It yeah. feels like James Bond actually changed in this story and has to move forward from a new position. Uh, I like the dialogue is great. The characters who are chasing after Bond and uh, Gan are really good and, and unique as opposed to just uh, um, your standard, like just random double O agent. So I, Philip Kennedy Johnson just uh, keeps hitting. Yeah, Philip Kennedy Johnson knows how to write stuff. Well, here's another comic that might leave you shaken, not stirred. The oh, Neighbors, number three wow. from Boom Studios, written by Jude Ellison S. Doyle, art by Letizia. Hey, Canici. the writers are on a strike right now, asshole. Tone it down. <laughs> What? Wow. <laughs> this is where like 50 comic books into the stack, and that's the time that you decided to make a joke, me saying writers. Well, yeah. I no, you, because you it looked like you pre written that. I mean, it was such a nice transition. I don't want people listening at home like, how did this podcast not have writers? That was fucking money. That guy came up with it top Here, of his head. Come here's on. Here's the thing unions are ridiculous. Like, what? Come on, just get a real job, do whatever Ooh. the studios want you to do. <laughs> sell out if there's some ai you can use it'll make things easier what are you saying this from a top feet. of a pile of money you fucking asshole all no, i'm I saying think it's, yeah i think it's obvious that um alex has just proven that there aren't writers writing on this uh, podcast <laughs> pretty much no uh we support the writers waga strong etc cetera, etc cetera. uh this book is really good Creepy as shit is what it is. Very creepy. I mean, there's a lot, I don't know, like you were saying before how it like, oh, it's weird these books are coming out when it's not Halloween. There are a lot of sort of like, like horror tones to the mm -hmm. comics in this mm -hmm. stack and the run we're doing right now. And this is just another one, one that we've talked about the just underlying tension that is in the story obviously but also just in the art it's a great that's a hard thing to do in comics and this book is just crushing it in that department. this is by the way about a family that moves to a small town and of course encounters some weird horrifying things that are going on there it seems like maybe they're being replaced by other creatures or something it's not entirely clear as of yet but things amp up in a big way in terms of the terror in this issue this is as quickly as it's going, we're only in the third issue. It's very much a slow burn at the same time. Very scary book. Very well done. Hellcat, number three for Marvel, written by Christopher Hellcat. Cantwell, art by Alex Linz. This is taking Hellcat and Sleepwalker and a bunch of other horror characters and putting them in some yeah. horrifying situations. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I think first off, you know, don't trust the talking bunny. I think we can all agree on that. But Bugs? Bugs Bunny? You know, Bugs Bunny's named that because Bugs Bunny goes around and puts spiders in people's mouths. Uh, don't you don't you taint Really? Bugs I always Bunny. thought it was because he was made of bugs, like Vincent D'Onofrio uh, and Men in Black. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, <laughs> are we sponsored by Vincent D'Onofrio and Men in Black? Because he you, certainly you, comes up Every time up I bring it up, I get um, 50 cents. That makes sense. Sugar water. <laughs> you paid sugar water. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got another I 50 cents you. every time I prompt so you many to times do a sugar and I've laughed every time. <laughs> that's, a, that's not a bit. That's just a real thing <laughs> that Alex keeps saying. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm trying to pull my skin back. Didn't really work. Um, yeah, Hellcat's art is absolutely fantastic. I love the style. It's such a creepy, cool thing. 
and they kind of pull you in with it. Uh, really impressed with this kind of balance of uh, uh, flashing forward and kind of telling this uh, creepy story. And uh, yeah, I, I had a blast with this book. And this book d doesn't have to be creepy. Like the one, the earlier books we talked about, All Eight Eyes, about spiders, Hollow's Eve, I feel like they're in that world. This Hellcat book is like chasing this tone. And to me, it makes it the most unsettling of the ones we've talked about. Ooh, I really like Hellcat. A lot of vulnerability here. The art is really good. The use of Sleepwalker alone is uh, what I'm here for. Wow. Justice Society of America, number four from DC Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Mikkel Janine and Jerry Ordway. This is jumping through the eras of the Justice Society as per Dagaton, basically time traveling Nazi, is trying to wipe them out of existence. As we find out in this issue, he's trying to do it from the future first. That's his plan this time. He's wiping out the future and then going backwards. We don't know exactly why, but we find out a lot more about that. And the X factor that is changing everything is Huntress, the daughter of Catwoman and Batman from the oh, future. Oh, traveling man. Back in time to help them fight. This is great. This is a great Justice Society story. Um, it plays to Jeff John's strengths. I think the duo of Mikkel Janine doing the modern stuff and Jerry Ordway doing the back in time stuff is a awesome compliment. I'm very happy with this book so far. I agree. Uh, this, feel, this feels like classic Jeff John setting up a larger universe. We get the uh, panel sort of early on in the story on page six or, or four where it's like, just a series of ideas coming down the pipeline. Beware Eclipso. Jer Jay Garrick will find joy again. The Sandman's nightmare will wear his mask. That stuff is like little piece, little, like four little spiders. I don't want to pop my oh, mouth and shoot them right you up. You know what I mean? I love the little things <laughs> so, like that. Oh, you ruined it. Just like, you know, go to a movie. A lot of people eat popcorn. I like pop spiders. Just a little, heat them <laughs> up, fry them a little bit, put a little bit of... Uh, that artificial venom that you get in the bottle right by the, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about. One Squirt pump it right or two on there. pumps? I go two pumps because, right. you know, I like to feel it. Uh, but I, I've been really enjoying this. This feels like a full-on Justice League book that should be sort of the crown jewel of the DC Universe right now. Uh, yeah, I, I love this. Uh, first off, kind of a funny premise of the time-traveling Nazi, just kind of like this ridiculous. Funny? Funny? <laughs> Just could kind you of like imagine? It. Could you imagine if like a Nazi <laughs> traveled through time back to this time? I would lose my shit. I'd be laughing yeah, so much. It's really fun. I just like, oh my god, Nazi. It's kind of a ridiculous premise. Like if someone said to you, "Oh, there's a time traveling Nazi," I'd be like, "Oh, that's kind of crazy and kind of mm -hmm. ridiculous." Well, you let me throw this out to you. Everybody right always word. throws out the scenario like, "Would you travel back in time and kill baby Hitler?" Would you let baby Hitler travel forward in time and kill you? What do you think, Pete? You go first. Bring it, baby Hitler. I'll fucking take you on. I'll give you shit. <laughs> wait, uh, you think, so wait, baby Hitler's going to come and try to kill baby Pete? Because no, I'm here for that. Regular Either Pete. way, I'll take him down. I don't care. Yeah. That really turns it on its edge if a baby Hitler's killing adult Pete. It makes you wonder <laughs> what, how bad is adult Pete if baby yeah. Hitler's going to kill him? Yeah, <laughs> that's very scary. Um, I've done a lot wrong in my life. I, I just think that this is like such a fun premise and also like that last line just really stayed with me long after I read it and thought it was such a cool line. And if it's okay, I want to spoil it here where you got uh, Batman in a panel and all of a sudden I'm your daughter. I've come back in time to save your life. Like, Oh, such a cool line. Um, especially to say that to Batman. I mean, come yeah. on. That is just, oh. Uh, and the yeah. special crazy part is he had to go kill a family to get that daughter. Like all people who have kids. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's fucked up. Why don't we move on and talk about Blue Book number four from Dark Horse Comics, written by James Tyon IV and Steve Fox, art by Michael Avon Oming and John McRae. Just a little note, we had Michael Avon Oming on the show the previous week and talked to him about Blue Book, so definitely check that out on the live show podcast. Another really good issue of this book, as we go, uh, we see the opposite narration i don't know why i'm blanking on the word for that but basically two people have been kidnapped by aliens we got to see one perspective the last issue now we see the other perspective which is totally different in the backup story we get an absolutely wild and weird 
true oh quote my unquote cryptid style that. story. What do uh, you guys think about this one? Fr- freak me the fuck out. The backup story did? The yeah. Cinder Woman? Yeah. Are you worried about like maybe bursting into flames? Yeah, it's a real issue for me. Why for you specifically? Yeah, yeah, I like to hang out a lot of gasoline. <laughs> wow. Ian got a lot of gasoline. Yeah. You should fill your uh, kiddie pool with regular water. Oh, that's a great yeah, idea. It's less less expensive and much less dangerous. <laughs> Wait, are you the reason there's that whole gas is refreshing. thing? Is that why? Yeah. Why gas is so expensive is because Pete fills, uh, fills up his bathtubs and kiddie pools with gasoline. Yeah, I like to yeah. relax in a nice, uh, cool pool of gasoline. <laughs> he what? likes the smell. And then I casually smoke over it. What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you are a real. Let me say, Pete, you're the one of the more casual smokers that mm-hmm. I know. But I, that, that definitely explains why you're always saying I like to have a little unleaded before I go to bed. And... <laughs> <laughs> wow, that does explain that. Are you yeah, sure you don't have you... a fucking writer back there coming up with these? Because I don't know, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, blue, thank blue, you. Blue book is is the arts, the, the real kind of hero here, and I, I've said that before. But I just feel like. I'm really impressed with the shading, the, the tone, the kind of the whole feel that you kind of get pulled in. You almost get abducted by this book. And I think that it's one of those oh, things now, where... Now yeah, it's yeah. got a writer. Uh, Do I just you think, have a writer back there? <laughs> no. Uh, I just think it's 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 this kind of creepy and this blue <laughs> tone to it just adds an extra layer of creepiness that is so enjoyable. Um but yeah, you feel bad for this lady. She just wants to remember this and they keep giving her a little hope and then take it away. Like, oh my God, she's going to be able to keep this alien book. And then it's like, no, no, you can't keep it. Uh, it's like, you, oh man. You know, Pete has a writer whenever he says the words, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he knows I love the idea it. that there's some writer on a picket line, some other like, so what? I, I work for uh, This Is Us. I wrote This Is Us. What do you do? <laughs> like, I don't know. I write puns for this fucking podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's it's bad. They don't pay anything. Yeah, they're picketing this podcast right now, <laughs> specifically. Uh, I I really love this book. I know Pete, you're highlighting the art, but I, the the James Tan JT Four story here is really good. Like, uh, really having like a threatening tone for the first three issues and half of this issue, and then it sort of flips and it's like a pretty chill hang with some aliens. Uh, for a while here is really nice. It makes it even more unsettling. Oddly, yeah. Hard to tell where it's going is a story. And then the backups they've been doing with these sort oh of my God. plucked out of history, like horror moments, horror stories I, and that feel very real, that have like sort of the X-File, like if it's an actual mm-hmm. X-File pulled. Yeah. Like, it's great. It's a great like two, like one, two punch of a series. Last but not least, Horror, number four from Boob Studios, written by Justin Jordan, art by Brom Revel. This is the final issue of this book about a small town who slaughters their entire uh. teen population once a year to replenish the crops or keep the cow going or whatever you want to call it. We get all the revelations in this issue as well as find out what's going to happen next. What do you think about the wrap up here on this book? Well, this is I like a- this. Okay. I thought this was a good, uh, <laughs> a really good, like, you get the sort of twist, uh, sort of two twists here, if I can say. Yeah, yeah, two twists, yeah. Two twists. And the, uh, it was like a, just a great package of Twizzlers. I liked, I liked both the twists. I like this book in general. Uh, they're the horror. This is more of an action over horror horror yeah, book agreed. in the way that I think works. So a little bit different than the other books we've talked about. Um, one just savage death, sort of in the middle. Uh, I yeah. thought, uh, but I love the way it ended. Yeah, I mean, would you stab your sibling to set them free? You know what I mean? Like you got to ask yourself that question. You know and. Uh, what was nice was as that dude was getting stabbed, he was like, thank you. Thank you for releasing. I feel like you fantasize about uh, stabbing your sibling. What? No, that's your... not something that's... Uh... The way you said it made me think. Do you see like... me sharpening a knife right now? Is that what you're saying? Because I thought <laughs> I, I was doing do up a little board. And I thought you couldn't hear or see that. I, I thought you were about to eat a giant steak dinner, but there's no food on your plate. That's so true. I know you're up to something. 
That's true. Uh, good book. If you didn't check this out and you're looking for a nasty horror book, definitely check this out in trade. If you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts, we do patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comics, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at comic book live on Twitter, comic book club live on TikTok and Instagram, comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Man.